The Gospel of John has a lot of words. And a lot of the sentences repeat. And sometimes it feels convoluted. But I'm going to tell you right here at the beginning, I'm going to preach about one word. I'm going to preach about joy. And as the brilliant scholar and author Brene Brown said, joy is terrifying. That's right. She said terrifying. Now more on that in a minute. I have this beautiful book by Mark Nepo. It's called The Book of Awakening. Some of you probably have it too. And I knew it would be a great resource for this sermon. And I have a small apartment reduced to one measly bookshelf after years of carting cartons and cartons of books around from apartment to apartment and never having room to put them out. So the books I have are not hard to find except the book that I'm looking for. <laughs> so I could not find it. And I'm scanning back and forth and up and down this bookcase. And then I remembered, I do have a little separate pile of books, just a little pile, um, and it's on my piano bench. And that's the books I've been reading lately. So it must be over there. So I grabbed a book. And instead of the Book of Awakening, in my hand was, in case you get hit by a bus. <laughs> How to organize now for when you're not around later. <laughs> ah, the irony, right? The irony. And yet, it's so very relevant for today's gospel. And that leads me to Brene Brown and to Jesus. In today's Gospel of John, we heard Jesus say, I speak these things in the world so that they may have my joy made complete in themselves. A more colloquial translation of that is, I say these things while I'm still in the world so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. But what really stands out about this passage is when Jesus is saying this about joy. In John's Gospel, he's saying it at the Last Supper, after Judas has left to betray him. It's a funny time to be talking about joy, don't you think? When he's not going to be around later. So chapter 13 or 14, depending to chapter 17 in John, are called the Farewell Discourse, and Jesus is getting ready for his leaving. And he's doing it by blessing and teaching and offering his disciples many things. And he's talking about joy this day, not because he doesn't know what's going to happen. It's because he does. This section of the farewell discourse of Jesus is directed to God. It's spoken directly to God. It is Jesus' prayer for his disciples. Those are the first words of today's gospel passage. Jesus prayed for the disciples. And Jesus is saying this prayer aloud so that they will hear it and be able to come back to it and hold on to it and understand it. And when he's no longer with them, and yes, when things get awful. But listen again to what Jesus prays. He's not praying for them to have strength in the face of hardship when things get awful. Jesus prays, Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. That's what Jesus prays for. Jesus asks God to have them, which means us, be one. And that oneness means abiding in love, as the Gospels of the last two weeks have made explicit. Right? Two weeks ago, we read about the vine and its branches, and a deep abiding love in each other, and a deep abiding from last week, the same way that Jesus and God are with each other. It's the oneness of mutual love that Jesus prays for. And the product of the oneness of mutual love is joy. 
a deep grounding in joy, even in the face of Jesus' departure. It doesn't preclude the hardship and the pain that are occurring in the world, but the joy that comes from that oneness in love is a firm foundation. Now, these may sound like easy and glib words or platitudes, but you know they are not for Christians. These words are Jesus' own prayer and promise. His prayer to share with his disciples the fullness of joy that is in himself. The joy that Jesus feels in being one with the Father. That comes from the mutuality of love in that relationship with God. That is what Jesus is praying for, for his disciples. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me so that they may be one as we are one, so that they may have my joy made complete in themselves. Jesus is praying those words for me and for you. Did you ever have someone pray directly for you, in person, right out loud? It has been profound for me when it occurred. In the tradition I grew up in, we didn't do a lot of extemporaneous or out loud preaching, or praying for that matter. And sometimes we're too shy to pray aloud informally or even to offer to pray for someone who may or may not say yes. But I can still feel the balm of that distant moment when a friend heard my distress and she said, may I pray for you? And then she stood in front of me and prayed aloud. Holy Father, protect Nancy and hear her. And it brought me to tears as I stood there and listened to her pray for me. That's what Jesus was doing today. So I've worked as a hospital chaplain, and it wasn't uncommon for me to peek into someone's room and have them say, I don't really feel like talking today, chaplain, but you could say a prayer for me. And I would go in and pray. And I'll tell you something, not one of the prayers from Chaplain Nancy resulted in a spontaneous, immediate, miraculous cure. But every single one of them felt like it mattered, reminding the person in the bed and me that our joy is being held in this love, in this relationship with God, even when what's going on around us doesn't look so good. Jesus knew things weren't going to look so good for a while. He knew he was leaving both in death and in ascension. And so he prayed aloud for his disciples right beside them so they would know that they had what they needed. Jesus had shown them God, God's love that is the fullness of joy. That prayer is so powerful. The Presbyterian minister, Dr. Mita Stamper, wrote, In the center of the prayer in today's gospel is Jesus' intention that his own should find his joy made complete in themselves. In last week's text that Rebecca explored with us so beautifully, right? Jesus' intention is that they should have joy in his command to them to abide in love. Now they're to find joy in overhearing Jesus' prayer on their behalf for the same thing, that they should be protected for love by the one in whose love they dwell. Dr. Stamper goes so far as to say, so the joy offered today is a deep and enduring creative gladness that even when it seems most unlikely, will inevitably come to Jesus' own. Now, I have to say to you, I paused a little bit on the inevitably because there have been plenty of times in my life when that joy didn't seem inevitable at all or it didn't seem resurrectable at all. And I have come to find out that it was. That's my experience. She says, perhaps Christians are also the joy bearers 
and midwives of joy for the world into which they, like Jesus, have been born of God and will be sent. And friends, they, they are we. This is how I always read the Gospels. When Jesus talks to his disciples, or even when just the twelve are gathered, they are we. Jesus is talking to us. Jesus is praying out loud for us. The Gospel of John is written probably some 60 years or so after Jesus has died and resurrected. The people that the writer of the Gospel of John is speaking to then are the people who are alive then. They're facing the difficulties of the life situations of their time. They're not really even Jesus' contemporaries. Yet they are the people who still felt and heard Jesus talking to and teaching and acting and praying directly for them. For us, right? Just the same in our time. Jesus, on the threshold of his crucifixion, is praying for their joy. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me so that they may be one as we are one, so that they may have my joy made complete in themselves. Jesus' joy is his oneness with God. And as I've used the phrase before, that joy is not circumstantial, it's existential. And it's the same for us. It's not about, is everything good in my life today? It's about, is my grounding good? Is the joy of being one with God, with Jesus, with all of you, and with this everyone, is that existential in us? I quote Dr. Stamper again because she says, against the backdrop of the world's hate, the radical nature of God's love is revealed in its fullest glory, and it is into such a world that Jesus' own are sent to testify and bear fruit, to love as Jesus loves. This echoes the talk that the Reverend Dr. Pamela Cooper White gave here this past Wednesday in our Becoming Beloved Community Speaker Series, she was talking on the very difficult topic of white Christian nationalism and speaking across the divide. She made it clear that there's no speaking across any divide if we can't love each other. Not in a metaphorical sense, but in a nitty-gritty belief on our part that every single person matters and can tell and can see that they matter to us. And that's no simpler today than it was in Jesus' day or in the time that the writer of the Gospel of John was writing. But we who have been made one in Christ, as Christ is one in God, we share the completeness of his joy as the grounding of our lives, the kind of joy that defied the pain and loss and disillusionment for Jesus and continues to for us, if we too hold on to it. So then I'm back to Brene Brown, and joy is terrifying. It's terrifying because it's so precious that we feel like it's fragile. We feel vulnerable to losing it, sometimes even the minute that we're feeling it. How many times have you heard someone say, or have you said yourself about something good, I don't want to jinx it, but, and then fill in the blank with the good thing. Brene Brown says, what we do in moments of joyfulness is, we try to beat vulnerability to the punch. We dress rehearse tragedy. And yeah, we do that, but I also think, well, we don't really have to dress rehearse it because every one of us lives it. Some of us right this minute, some of us some time ago, some of us tomorrow, we're all facing it. We live in a world where hate has become acceptable discourse and war is rampant and people we love may be sick or going through difficulty and we ourselves are facing hardships and hard times. 
So how dare Jesus tell us we should have his joy complete in us? He can tell us that because that joy that he's speaking of, that joy is not fragile because the love of God is that joy and it cannot be conquered. And in the Gospel of John, following God's command is the connection. And guess what the command is, right? Love. It's a circle. Love is joy. Joy is love. This is our command. Go forth and love. That is the basis of your joy. The language goes around and about, but the Gospel of John is all about people being sent. We are sent. We are sent to do what Jesus commands. What Jesus commands is to love. When we do what Jesus commands, then we are connected. Then we are one with Jesus, who is one with God, and the joy of that oneness is beyond everything. These are familiar themes from the Gospel of John. This is what it's about. It doesn't preclude pain, but pain does not rout it either. When Jesus prays for his disciples, when Jesus prays for us in today's gospel, he knows he's leaving them and us. And he knows it's going to be hard. He's preparing them and blessing them and reminding them where their joy lives in the love of belonging to Jesus. So I nodded to myself while writing this because maybe that's why my hand landed on the book in case you get hit by a bus. That book title, right, is meant to be cheeky, but it's really not funny, especially to those of us who have lost loved ones in hard ways, right? But the preparation that it's about is a loving thing, right? And preparation is Jesus' loving prayer today. The book, not the holy book, but, you know, the cheeky book, says it's intended in crisis to help you renew, reinforce, and remind yourself of hope for the rest of your life. Maybe it is the holy book after all. Our hope is Jesus and the joy he has given us reminding us in the face of what the world can do that God is with us and we are one and we are sent into the world to share that. The command is love and we are to be the joy bringers, right? Christi Christians in general have a bad rap or an earned rap, you know, of harping on people about their sin, of not being the joyful people. But we are the bearers of the joy of being one with Jesus Christ. If that is not being a joy bearer, we're not doing it right. And so, I did find the Mark Nepo book at the bottom of the pile. And I opened it up, and it was right to this passage. Everything that divides and separates removes us from what is sacred. And so weakens our chances for joy. We are one in Christ as Christ is one in God, sent out by Jesus not to be separate, but to be immersed in the world, not waiting for some someday heaven, but living the fullness of love now, grounded in joy now. That is not fragile. In the midst of this world, don't be afraid to hear Jesus' prayer out loud for you, standing right there next to you. And let your joy be complete. <laughs>